to put me on uh, the uh, share screen here, Rob. Um, is it sharing? Because I want to try and put mine up here as well. So we're going to just go straight to the text. I'm just going to open up by reading, first of all, just in the text of the book of Revelation. Um, and I'll read this uh, for you, um, the first uh, uh, three verses. This is the revelation, or in Greek, the apocalypse, the unveiling of Yeshua the Messiah, which God gave to him, so that he could show his servants what must happen very soon. He communicated it by sending his angel to his servant, Yochanan, who bore witness to the word, or the Logos in his Greek, of God. And that's the word that uh, John used when he wrote the, uh, the gospel, um, is the Logos of God. And of the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah, as much as he saw. Blessed are the reader and hearers of the word of this prophecy, provided they obey the things in it. I like that, provided they obey the things in it. Why? Because the time is near. It's interesting, I've had uh, so many wild and crazy misrepresentation of the book of, of, of Revelation uh, recently on the internet and on social media. I don't know if you've been watching some of these things. It's causing so many to live in panic and fear fear and worry, stressing out over what's happening with current events, especially down here in Melbourne. Uh, so many think we're now in the end times. People have been thinking that, by the way, for 2,000 years. And it's causing many to just you know, get stressed out. But I want to really stress today, we're going to look at the uh, book of Revelation, look at the facts of Revelation. And again, I, I uh, just want to really focus toward that that you, you really see uh, what we're going to be looking at today is just the text of Revelation. We're not going to be looking at what other, uh, um, what I call um, uh, sensationalist books. Uh, I'll put myself on the line here. Things like Left Behind series, Late Great Planet Earth, and books like that. Um, not going to look at them, not going to even look at what internet memes say. Not going to mention other books of the Bible. We're just going to look at what does Revelation says. One of the basic rules to interpret the Bible is go for what each book says in and of itself, and then you can compare with other books the the, the uh, strengths the, and where they align, where they don't align. And understand, Revelation was not written to scare the daylights out of people. I see so many people after reading Revelation or hear a teaching in Revelation or watching a movie in Revelation, they're left in total fear. If your reading and study of Revelation ends you in you in fear, then you folks are doing it wrong because it wasn't written to bring us fear. It was written to bring us life. So we've got to remember that. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, one thing I want us to look at, uh, first of all, is the realm of uh, why Revelation was written. First of all, it was actually written to encourage believers in Yeshua in a time of brutal persecution that they were going through in Yochanan's day, in John's day, to inform them, to, to build their faith and continue them in worship of Adonai and not fall back into emperor worship. The whole book is about who you're going to worship. Is it going to be Adonai? Is it going to be the emperor? That's been the question of the ages, even through to today. Um, was it going to be Caesar? Was it Pharaoh? Was it Baal? Was it Nebuchadnezzar? All these other ones, all the way through to then and even to today. Um, a number of years ago, our people were faced uh, with, uh, are you going to say praise Hitler? Uh, no, that wasn't a good thing to say. But again, that's what it's all about. Revelation was written during the reign of the brutal Roman emperor, Dominitan. He was a psychopath, greater psychopath even than Emperor Nero. Both Nero and Dominitan and other emperors as well demanded worship that they would say would bring empire harmony, what's called Pax Romana or Roman peace. If you didn't worship the emperor, then you were considered to be the problem, not part of the problem. You are the problem that causes earthquakes and volcanoes and floods and fires and famines. The barbarians are at the border because you didn't worship the emperor. And so therefore that's punished by death. If you don't worship the empress, emperor, you're also punished economically as, a, as a, uh, a big emotional push to make sure you worship the emperor. And you couldn't buy or sell. People refused to do business with you to make you worship the emperor. Because if you don't, you're the problem. You're causing all the problems in the world. And for worshiping the emperor was 
for 99% of the population was fine. They already worship many gods. What's one more? Who, who cares? Especially if that work, worshiping that one more gives over all the empire harmony and you can do it and have great uh, uh, economic lifestyle. Why not? Just one more. Who cares? But for 1%, as in the Jews, the Christians, you cannot worship the emperor because God says you shall have no other gods before me. And this refusal to worship Dominican caused savage persecution toward Christians, first of all, and then later Jews. And especially against the Gentiles who had one day been worshipping emperor, then accepted Yeshua as their Messiah and realized I can't worship the emperor anymore. And so the next day refused to worship the emperor. And so therefore they say, well, I can only worship the one true God of Israel. That's punishable by death. So Revelation was written during this time frame of, uh, of great persecution. And we have to remember that uh, uh, through the whole book, that this is to see things how God sees them. Look at things by God's perspective. Notice in the book of Revelation, if you read through carefully, there's never a time where God is not in control. It always has so many times, like this epic battle, a Steven Spielberg movie, where there's a struggle of powers. You don't know who's going to win until you get to the last page of the book and God wins. Uh, I actually get annoyed by that statement by people who say, I've read the end of the book and we win. Well, I read the beginning of the book and we win there too. And the middle of the book and all the way through the book, God wins at every point. Can somebody say uh, amen to that one? We've got to believe that he is in control. There's never a time where God is caught out. It was written first to the seven congregations that surrounded uh, John's area, uh, likely the ones that he was the apostle to and oversood. But it's also written to believers of all times, all generations for the last 2,000 years, turned to the book of Revelation and said, that's, that, that's our day. We're living in that day. Uh, we're, we're the end times. This is it. A thousand years ago at the end of the first millennial, that's what they were saying. But it's all about rising up, and come into a new level of worship of Adonai, trusting God, serving Yeshua with no fear. Okay, so time to put a few sacred cows on the altar. Again, I hope you don't mind, but uh, through it all, I hope that at the end of this, you'll be able to look through later. I'm very happy for you to read the book of Revelation and come back and answer me from that, not from any other source, because I go by the great phrase of sola scriptura, only scripture. Only what the Bible says. What does Revelation not say? One of my little peeves that I have as a, as, as a, as a biblical scholar, it's not revelations, plural, is one. It is only revelation. There's only a single revelation that's happening here, and that's reve revealing Yeshua as the Messiah and the only one worthy of worship. Here's a big shock for you. The book of Revelation never mentions the Antichrist as a world ruler at the end of time. Why are so many people in panic about an Antichrist that's going to come and be a world ruler when it's never mentioned in the book of Revelation? In fact, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, I'm happy for you to prove me wrong, nowhere in the Bible does it have an Antichrist as being a one world ruler at the end of time. There's only a couple of mention of one quarter of Antichrist, and that's in 1 John and in 2 John, and it's those who deny that Yeshua came in the flesh, or those who are anti him being the Messiah, anti-Christ, anti the Messiah. They are anti-Yeshua being the Messiah. And it's individuals, and it's a spirit of an age who deny that. We could say out in our world today, so much of secular media is anti-Yeshua being the Messiah. You have world religions around who are anti-Yeshua being the Messiah. It's a spirit of, but never do you find anywhere in scripture where there is a one world ruler at the end of the time called Antichrist. Anybody surprised with that revelation? A uh, bit out of there? Because again, I've said that to some people. I've had people get angry with me because brother so-and-so taught it or this one wrote about it. What does the Bible say? Okay, another one for you. There's no clear seven-year tribulation period in the book of Revelation. There's only one mention and that's in Revelation chapter 7, 14. And it talks about all the martyrs uh, in heaven who came out of the great tribulation. And it says it in the past 
tense, not a future tense that is going to happen, but as a past tense. And many scholars today look at this and say, great is because of longevity of time, not great because of some big intense persecution that's about to come. I know some people who are living in fear, waiting for the, for the, for the great tribulation to come. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I'm going to survive. The great is by longevity, not by the intensity of a one-time event. In fact, John's day believed they were in the tribulation time. The early church fathers, they believed they were in the tribulation time. So many generations in the last 2,000 years, they believed they were in tribulation times. So uh, again, the early church fathers actually spoke about uh, being in, in, in pre-millennial uh, because they believed they were in the tribulation. Is Yeshua coming back before the millennial reign or after the millennial reign? That's where they, their question was. There's no mention, by the way, of seven years of anything, seven years of plagues or seven years of tribulation. This is what people put into this text, but the text itself doesn't say it. Revelation uh, is, is not about uh, the glorifying those who oppose God. It's not about the beast. It's, in fact, the beast doesn't show up until chapter 13. It's not about the devil. He doesn't show up until chapter 12. Uh, it's not about the dragon. and not about all these others, the false prophet. They are just tools in God's hands for God's eternal purposes to shake humanity to the place of repentance. There's no clear rapture time. Sorry, those who believe in pre-trib rapture or all the other things, so pre-trib, mid-trib. I've sat in the USA under some of the top end time specialists and some are pre-trib, some are mid-trib, some are post-trib, some are amillennial who doesn't believe in tribulation. I tend to be pan-trib, it's all going to pan out in the end. But each one of them uses sometimes the same verse out of the book of Revelation to prove their point. But there's no clear point in anywhere. And the book of Revelation says, this is the rapture. It doesn't say that. You have to read into it. The book is not about 666. 666 is just in chapter 1, verse chapter 13, verse 18. And it's all about getting a token, a marker to prove that you have worshipped the emperor so you can then do business. Some manuscripts, and an actual quite a significant number of manuscripts, actually says 616, not 666. It's not a, in fact, even the next generation writing on the book of Revelation didn't even know what it meant. That was something local code for them. It's not to prove that Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist or Donald Trump or Obama or the internet. I had someone send me stuff the other day that COVID-19 breaks down into 666. It's just evidence of who's worshipped the emperor. And it's not, the book of Revelation is not a manual for the 21st century times. First, it was to John's community. It's applied for the last 2,000 years. And it also applies to us today because there are still events unfolding. And many times repeating what's already happened in history. Power of the prophetic word are fulfilled in Isaiah's day. And then subsequently, the power of the prophetic word all the way down to our day. The book of Revelation is like that. I find an issue where too many people start their time clocks from when they first read the book of Revelation, rather than realizing that clock's been ticking for 2,000 years already, and there's many uh, fulfillments that's taken place over 2,000 years, and they can be fulfilled again today. So what does Revelation actually say? It says God is in control. Chapter one starts off, and we, I wish we had time to expand on this, showing the spectacular glory of God in his heaven. And, and, and it's actually an echo of, of Ezekiel. So many people, when they read Revelation, turn to Daniel. But actually, uh, um, uh, John was reading Ezekiel more than what he's reading Daniel. And Ezekiel starts off showing the spectacular of God in his, head, in his heaven over against the pageantry of Nebuchadnezzar. John starts it here against the pageantry splendor of Caesar. Our God is greater than Caesar or of any world ruler. I mean, people get upset over who wins elections. It doesn't matter. God's in control. And the messages to the seven congregations focus them on challenging all of them to come up to a new level of serving and worshipping and overcoming in Messiah. Let's have a look what it does say. We've looked at some of the things it doesn't say. And we could spend uh, several sessions un unpacking what it doesn't say. We can spend more sessions unpacking what it does say. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After these things I looked, 
That's after speaking to the th uh, seven different congregations there. I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, which was like a shelfer, a trumpet speaking with me, that's actually was Yeshua saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So must takes place soon within there. So John, by the way, have a look at the text carefully here. It doesn't say for everybody to come up here. It just says for John to come up here. He is a lone call. People who preach pre-tribulation rapture said this is where the, the whole congregation, the whole church, the whole body of Messiah is raptured. The text does not say that. It's all in the singular. It's all for John to come up only for a short period of time till he can see what's happening on earth from God's perspective. And then he is to come back and, 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 and to everybody and say, this is what I saw. Be encouraged. So keep worshiping Yeshua. Let's have a look at things from God's perspective. As I said before, God is always in control. He's never in a panic in the book of Revelation. Never do you find God say, oh my goodness, what's happening? What's going on here? He's always the one who's not just following behind what the devil's doing, following by what other leaders are doing, like the beast and others. He's the one who's causing it to happen. He's the one who's, <clears throat> excuse me, releasing them. There's no epic end time battle. God wins at the beginning and all the way through. It's all happening because God is organizing and releasing the events. I was just had someone the other day sending me stuff. Um, I get sent stuff all the time, sending me stuff about the devil doing all these seals and the, and the, and the blowing of the shofars. No, it doesn't say that. At every point, it is God who's doing this. He is sending out his angels to do these things. It's the lamb who opens the seals. It's the angels, God's angels, not the devils, who blow the shofars. It's God's angels who releases the, blow, the, the, the bowls. By the way, uh, another thing for you to have a look at and study later, match the plagues that were there in Egypt opposing Pharaoh with the ones that come out in the seals, the shofar and the bowls opposing Caesar. There's a, actually a parallel here between that of, of um against uh, Pharaoh and now against Caesar. Very similar plagues coming through. Again, it's not the devil doing it. It is God in control. Uh, a big surprise, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh my goodness, again, I've heard so many teachings of fear in that. But the first horse that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, who goes out there and is part of the releasing of the first seal that the lamb releases, the rider of the white horse is actually Yeshua. Typical in, 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 in uh, apocalyptic literature, they'll have a mystery at the beginning and unfold at the end. Oh, so that's who that musk man is. In chapter, uh, chapter uh, 19, verses 11 to 14, there is the one of the rider of the white horse with the sword going out of his mouth, the sharp two-edged sword, is actually Yeshua. He is leading the armies of heaven to war against God's opponent and to shake humanity to repentance. So we don't have to fear the four horsemen of the apocalypse because Yeshua is the one who's leading them all. And again, God is shaking in heaven and earth with all events to bring everybody to repentance. But so often, tragically, people hide from God's wrath and refuse to repent. They prefer to worship the, the Caesar and the beast because it's convenient. The cost of what it is to worship God can be enormous. And we're finding, even today, I was reading this morning about a church in California who's been hit with a $50,000 fine because they allowed the people in the service to worship. There's a rule in California, you can get together, but you can't worship. And they said, well, what's the point of coming together? We're going to worship anyway. They were hit with a $50,000 fine. Will it soon come in our world, even the Western world, where worshipping God is illegal? If that's the case, then we're back in the book of Revelation. Who are you going to obey, God or Caesar? All of God's opponents in the book of Revelation have limited roles with limited power and with limited authority. And they're all under God's limits. The fallen star, the fallen angels, the beast, the dragon, the devil, the false prophet, they all have limited power according to what God lets them to have at that time and that point of time to do what God wants to have done to shake humanity towards worship. And again, 
Notice also in the book of Revelation, the first ones to have a sign, a, sh a seal, is actually not the beast seal of 666 or 616, but actually God's people are the first ones who are sealed and sealed to protect them against all the things that's coming around. So why worry about 666 or 616 or the mark of the beast or so many people talk about the mark of the Antichrist, someone who doesn't actually exist, but why worry about that if you already have God's seal? Focus on what God is doing, not what the devil's doing. Through the whole book of Revelation, never do you find fear in heaven, never do you find panic, you'll find full of faith and worship. We'll see that in our next session in a couple of weeks. The focus of Revelation is toward a wedding feast with a new heavens, a new earth, with a new Jerusalem. So within here, all these different things that come about within here, and I just really want you to really grasp this as much as you can. Please hear this. Revelation 12, uh, the, the dragon, the, the devil, Satan, and he goes out there and tries to seek to kill the male child. Uh, two male childs that we find in, in, in the scriptures, in the Tanakh, we find that of Israel. The devil always tried to destroy Israel as God's people and stop them fulfilling what God set them out to do. Secondly, of that of Yeshua. They tried to kill Yeshua. I mean, we, you know the, 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 uh, uh, the birth stories and things like that uh, again. But, and also now the third area is us, his followers. So goes out to do war against the followers. Couldn't kill uh, uh, the woman with the male child, but then goes out to kill the followers, which is us trying to destroy us. And so much persecution has happened through the last 2000 years, but God protects. It's interesting that the devil always loses the war that he starts or tries to start. Revelation chapter 12 tries war in heaven. He's cast out the book of, uh, of, uh, of, um, Isaiah also records that. Uh, chapter 19, again, thrown out. Chapter 20, thrown out. Ends up with his worshippers and his followers and his angels in a lake of fire. The scripture says forever. And the Greek says forever. If you go to the Hebrew translation, it also says forever. There's a teaching out there in modern preaching that says this is only temporary. No, the Greek word is forever. And the last time you look it up, that means forever. So funny how that works out. Yes, there is a beast. Yes, the beast in those days was considered to be Caesar. But since then, any ruler or system over history that's tried to stop the worship of God, we find that all the way through history through to today. So what Caesars do we have out there? What systems do we have out there? And I know people who live in, in, in uh, some, uh, um, I'll put it out there, in some Muslim countries where you cannot worship uh, uh, the God of Israel. You, you'll be killed for doing that. And you've got to be ready with a quote from Quran. There's a confession of, of who you worship. That's like a marker. That's like a 616, a 666. That's a way of proving that you worship <clears throat> Muhammad. And you know, I know people in India who have the same thing under Buddhism or under Hinduism, people in other Asian countries under Taoism, all these things that are there as systems to stop. That's the beast that we face even to this day. But the beast again doesn't appear until chapter 13, after the seven seals are opened by the Lamb, after the seven shofars uh, ha have been blown, and just before the time of the seven bowls of wrath of God's wrath. So shows up just in time to get God's wrath. Well timed uh, for that to happen. Bad luck for him. The beast is not doing the events of revelation, nor is the devil, nor is the dragon. The power of the beast comes from just being worshipped by the world. Okay. Does not have an eight power itself, comes from being worshipped by the world. Those who don't follow Yeshua wearing God's seal. They will worship the, the beast. And so therefore, that's where his power comes from. The beast will seek to do war against God and all those who worship God, but at every point fails. At times, over, seems to overcome. But when they overcome uh, those who are believers and the believers become martyrs, it gives them power into eternity. So God always wins. So let's have a look 
are just a few random things out of the book of Revelation that I think are so significant. We need to consider these. Uh, again, I'm hoping to get in one day and do a uh, whole series on the book of Revelation. I have the people down here uh, want me to do an online series with it. What does Revelation say? First of all, it talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah in chapter 5, verse 5. And here's so many people talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Absolutely totally completely agree and people say the book of revelation talks about the lion well yes it does but only once interestingly 29 times it's the lamb of god that does the action has the lion triumph yes but what is the one that does the action that is that of the lamb the sacrificial lamb is what overcomes not the brute power of of violent conflicts our power comes from sacrifice and it's the sacrifice of the lamb that overcame the evil one it's the sacrifice of the lamb that destroys the evil one there even in the book of revelation and all the things that's happened so let's focus on the action of the lamb we remember what the lion has triumphed yes but let's focus on the action of what the lamb does in the book of revelation so imagine the lamb going up against the fierce beast you think, well, who's going to win? Well, that's the answer or question all the way from the book of Revel from the book of Genesis. Sorry, from the book of Exodus. Will the Paul Israel defeat the mighty Pharaoh? Well, yes, because of the action of the sacrificial Passover lamb. I wish I had time to unpack that some more. What does Revelation say? It's worship. It is worship in heaven. It starts off all the way through the beginning of the book. And we're going to look at this more next week. So I'll skip over this lightly uh, next time we meet. But the whole aspect is worship throughout the book. Hear me now and we'll deal with it more in a couple of weeks. At every point of every action that's done in the book of Revelation, it's launched by worship. Heaven is filled with worship, even though where John's community are, they are facing tremendous persecution, the tremendous tribulation, tremendous death around them. But in heaven, there is worship. And the answer is down here, we join in with heaven's worship because that's what causes us to overcome. Who will we worship? Will it be God? Will it be the Caesars of this world? Who should we follow and worship? Every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people are there to worship God. Again, we'll unpack that more and more. But sadly, too often people did not repent and did not worship on earth. They tried to hide from the wrath that was going on around them. <clears throat> what does Revelation say? Well, it's interesting. Have a look in, in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, later to see what Isaiah looking down the channel of time two and a half thousand years uh, maybe more who knows how long we will go on for but he saw worship happen at the heavenly altar of incense I have a whole message on this but it's interesting there in, in uh, John saw exactly what Isaiah saw and he said he took the scroll that is the lamb and the four living beings and the 24 elders um, um, fell down in front of the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls filled with pieces of incense. Now, incense is what's done there in the temple as part of worship toward God, but it says here the incense are the prayers of God's people. This is repeated again in chapter 8, verse 3. He sees it again there at another angel with a golden incense burner stood at the altar, a great amount of Incense was given to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on before the throne. Now, here's the thing I want you to get. The book of Revelation and what John saw, one of the first things he sees in chapter 5, verse 8, although he's thinking down there in the middle of persecution, God, do you hear? Do you see? Do you care? Do you know what we're going through? The first thing he encounters, yes, your prayers are gathered together and are presented to God as living incense. So folks, no matter what you're going through, just know right now, God hears your prayer, and your prayers are gathered up and put together as incense toward the throne of God, and therefore is completely heard. 
And so you can have, have total assurance like John was given. Our prayers are being heard in heaven. They've been gathered, they've been collected, and our prayers are what we're going through. Our cries are what we're going out, what, all the different we're facing. Our prayer is like incense of worship to God. So your prayers make a difference. They are incense as worship to God. So again, uh, be, be encouraged that your prayers do make a difference. What else did John see? He saw people having God's seal placed on their foreheads, marking them for protection. Chapter 7, verse 3, and it's talking here initially about the 144,000 uh, of Jewish people, which is symbolic of, 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 of every nation, uh, uh, of, of every tribe of Israel, but also refers to that believers in general don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So the mark of God on the forehead. Chapter 9, verse uh, 4. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or plants or of any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. So in other words, those who follow after God have the seal on them. God will seal us for protection, no matter what we're going through. Like as in Egypt, when they went through all the plagues, the people of Israel were protected so often from those plagues, although the plagues went on to those of the Egyptians. And again, it's all about having God's seal. And if you've got God's seal on you already by the fact that you have accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, why are you worried about getting the mark of the beast? Or as people say, the mark of the Antichrist. Again, someone who's not even in the Bible. But why are you worried about getting the mark of the beast? Stop it. Stop it already. And, and, and again, when people, uh, uh, even when people's, uh, God's people are overcome, as we find in the books, uh, Revelation 13, verse 7, it is for God's eternal purposes with all these things. What else did God, uh, would John see? He saw two witnesses. Oh my goodness, how many have heard uh, theories and speculations of two witnesses over uh, the last, uh, I think Rob referred to, 41 years of being in ministry? You know, there's actually a uh, <clears throat> security force in Israel that's ready for what they call the, the silly season, which is the springtime when they have people coming to Israel uh, who are Christians who try to become one of the two witnesses. They have this delusion that they land in Israel and they think that they're going to be one of the two witnesses and they try to get themselves into a place where they'll get killed in the streets of Jerusalem because that's their call from God. No joke. That's actually a thing that Israel faces. Um, um, they have it every year. Uh, quite a number of two witnesses show up. And they've had speculations. Is this Moses? Is this Elijah? Is this Enoch? Is this other things? Hey, read the text carefully. The two witnesses are the Jewish and the Gentile believers in Yeshua. Those two branches of the olive tree that come out from the root of the olive tree, being Messiah, the two branches go out. The two witnesses through the scriptures are that of the olive tree. Have a look in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 to 24, talks about this. So those are the two witnesses. So if you're Jewish today, great, you're one of the witnesses. If you're Gentile today, you are one of the witnesses. Will there be a, 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 a slain of that or attempted? Absolutely. But the miracle is coming back to life again. People focus on the death of the witnesses, but they... Uh, uh, and sometimes the, 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 the body of Messiah has been overcome. I've uh, served a, a couple of years uh, at the garden tomb in Jerusalem, uh, leading hundreds of people around uh, the garden tomb uh, uh, every, every day. It's just absolutely amazing. Instead of pointing to a PowerPoint, I can point to the real thing. This is the place of the crucifixion. This is the place of the burial, but also the place of the empty tomb. But you get to meet people who come from different countries who are facing horrendous persecutions where they think that they've overcome and they've wiped out the believers, but they always come back to life. When the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Iron Curtain lifted, uh, the shock was how many believers there were. When the Bamboo Curtain of China lifted after the Chinese uh, uh, borders opened up, again, the shock was how many believers there actually were. The people had thought they'd been wiped out, but we always come back and resurrected back to life. Hopefully you can get some encouragement from that. What does the book of Revelation say? John saw the Lamb's book of life. 
where those who are written are following Yeshua have had their, their, they've got the seal of God on their foreheads. In other words, on our minds, on our memories within there. And it informs us uh, that to all will worship the beast, except those whose names are written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb slaughtered before the world was founded. <clears throat> Interesting that Revelation 13, 8 uh, sees God living outside of time and the lamb is slain for us before even the world was founded. Uh, again, you've got to think eternity, not uh, on a timeline for this. But Yeshua knew what was coming and from the very beginning was as if he had been slain for all of eternity from the, even before the world was founded. And it says there, chapter 20, verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. 21 verse 27, nothing impure may enter it, that is the new Jerusalem, nor anyone who does shameful things or lies. The only one who may enter are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, if you want to enter into eternity with God, then your name means to be in the Lamb's book of life, not registered with the beast, but with the Lamb. Okay, the one who overcomes is the lamb. The name is written when we accepted Yeshua's sacrifice as God's lamb for our sin and we are sealed with his mark. Why do we have to worry about any other mark or any other things? Our name is written in the book of life and I pray and believe your name to be written in the lamb's book of life. What did John see? He saw Babylon overthrown. This is both religious systems overthrown as many times religious systems have risen up against uh, uh, um, uh, God's people. In fact, the Roman empire was a religious system worshiping Caesar that was overthrown a couple of hundred years after revelation was written, but also that of an economic system. Many times the economic system is used to control God's people and that has collapsed. And the book of Revelation in chapter 17 and chapter 18, I wish we had time to again to unpack these chapters. But again, they collapsed. Again, it's happened in John's day, but also many times through the last 2000 years. And we've seen it happen in world systems, even to this day as well. And we pray that this will happen even more. Again, the book is about who you're going to trust and worship for your economy. And that's what it's about. Tremendous put, pressure put on John's community for their economy to go back into Caesar worship. I actually read an article once written from those days where a person was in court uh, uh, charged with being Christian. And that's a charge, a penalty that associated with death because you are the problem breaking Pax Romana. And the, the, the judge is begging and pleading for this person, just go out and do one sacrifice so I can give you the token to prove that you've done the sacrifice. And the guy said, I cannot, I can only worship um, uh, my Lord, my God. Well, partake with somebody else's sacrifice. I cannot. Well, join in with the group sacrifice. I cannot. Well, instead of an animal, just do a bird. I cannot. He finally tried to negotiate this guy down to just throw a pinch of salt on the altar and I'll let you go free. And the guy said, no, I won't. I won't do any worship of, 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 of the beast. And so uh, oh, Caesar and so the judge sentenced, uh, sentenced him to death and said, I, I, I can't let you off. And if you won't worship in any way, fashion or form, then you must die. And so this is the judge trying to get the guy off, but he refused to. I always wondered, what would I do in that situation? Even down to a pinch? Oh, okay, I'll do a pinch and God can forgive me. But this guy said, no, I won't. And he became a martyr. So many times you find that the book of, of Revelation talks about the martyrs and the martyrs are the ones who actually overcome. Although the martyrs cry out, how long, oh God, do we have to put up with this? But again, it calls us to trust God for our economy. Trust God, not the temporary things of this world. And God saw, uh, John saw all of God's opponents overcome, Satan and the dragon thrown out of heaven into the lake of fire forever. What else did he see? That of the uh, wedding. Again, we got the, as a wedding feast that we see there. And that's where we have the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And that's the uh, places where we go for eternity. Those whose names written in the Lamb's Book of Life overcome the evil of the world, the persecution to worship God 
above all else. And again, we're finished with the same verse. This is the revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling of Yeshua, the Messiah, which God gave to him so he could show his servants what must happen very soon. He communicated by sending his servant, uh, uh, Yochanan, who bore witness to the Lord, uh, of, to the word of God and to the testimony of Yeshua, the Messiah, as much as he saw. Blessed are the reader and hearers of the words of this prophecy, provided they obey the things written in it, for the time is, year, is near. Folks, I just want to encourage you toward uh, just focusing on Yeshua, what he is doing and what God is doing, encouraging you to read the book of Revelation again. And this time, read it from a position of faith and only what the text says, not what all other things say, but what the text of Revelation says, because you should come out with faith, not fear. Amen. Blessings to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. We are so, so thankful to have you. And um, Father God, I just pray that you would put your blessing upon Ashley and, the, and his family and those down in Melbourne, Lord. We just ask that you would be with them and be with them today, that they would feel your tangible presence as, Lord, we, we get to experience this together. Lord, we just pray that you would truly bless them. And we are so thankful, Lord, for the ministry that he's given us. In Yeshua's precious name. Amen. We'll see you later, Ashley. We'll uh, we'll talk we'll talk again soon.